Hi there, I'm Yona Lansky. I'm the Director of the Healthcare Access Research Program in Developmental Disabilities at CAMH, and I'm here with uh, Dr. Liz Greer, Family Physician and Medical Director at Anguinada, which is a community service for people with developmental disabilities in Kingston. And we're just going to repeat a didactic that we gave um, to folks who are participating in the Project ECHO focused on intellectual and developmental disabilities here in Ontario. We have no uh, financial uh, disclosures, and um, this work that we did with the ECHO is funded by the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care with some in-kind support from CAMH, and uh, the things that we're going to be talking about today are based on information that is evidence-based. Let's take a moment for people maybe a little bit less familiar with the population to go over who it is that we are speaking about. I chose a beautiful photo of some individuals with developmental disabilities who I have the privilege of working with. Um, and I think what's important to highlight here is that these individuals are very much a part of our community, uh, working and living in our community in a number of different places, and also that they have a range of disabilities, some of which, for example, Down syndrome, which you might notice or recognize, but many disabilities which are invisible to us. For example, autism has a range of etiologies, and it may not be obvious at all from looking at someone that they have autism or that they have mild intellectual disability. The infographic at the bottom of this page is based on work that we did through the HCARD program. And I wanted to pull it up here because it's important to understand that as a group adults with developmental disabilities um, are vulnerable to having a range of health care issues. Um, so higher rates of both physical and mental health conditions occur in this population. And concerningly, there are a much greater risk over time of interacting with our healthcare system at the emergency department or hospital level. So going to hospital, repeatedly visiting a hospital, having long-term admissions because it's difficult sometimes for them to be discharged to where they want to be, um, living in long-term care, and importantly, having four times almost the likelihood of dying prematurely at a younger age uh, than what we see in the general population. And it's important to know that these issues happen for people with developmental disabilities, not just because of something inherent in the disability itself, but because of how they are interacting with our social care system, with our health care system, how quickly we can recognize and respond to issues for them, and then give them the health care services that they need. Thank you, Yona, uh, for that very helpful introduction here. So I'd like to speak just from a medical perspective about adults with IDD and risks around COVID-19. So this group is at risk, a uh, higher risk of contracting COVID for a number of reasons. Uh, many of these adults live in congregate uh, group home settings, and many of them rely on caregivers for their basic needs, such as supports for showering or um, for being transferred to a wheelchair, um, resulting in very frequent close contact with others for them. Many adults with IDD have difficulty understanding and a great deal of difficulty coping with the rules around self-isolation and uh, managing some of the self-hygiene measures that are so important to prevent the spread of the virus. Individuals with IDD who have um, difficulty uh, speaking or are nonverbal may have the inability to report some very subtle early signs of COVID, such as a new sore throat, a headache, or fatigue. And this emphasizes the importance right now for group homes to be taking um, clients' temperatures twice a day. Um, and also being very aware of a, a change in someone's baseline. For example, someone who has a chronic cough, developing a worsening cough that would make us worried about a new respiratory illness having started. Secondly, uh, adults with IDD are at increased risk of severe illness with COVID. Uh, and this is in part due to some of the comorbidities that adults with IDD have at higher rates. A uh, big one is respiratory conditions, and at least 40% of uh, individuals with IDD die from respiratory illness. Other comorbidities that are increased in adults with IDD include heart disease and diabetes, ones that are known to be associated with severe illness with COVID. And lastly, 
We also know that adults with IDD experience premature aging. We have research that shows that an adult with IDD would have similar frailty um, indicators at the age of 50 as someone would at the age of 80 in the general population. And then lastly, this group is at increased risk of emergency department visits and hospitalizations for non-COVID issues during this time. As Yona mentioned, the risk of uh, hospital or ED use is already very high in this population, but in particular due to the COVID restrictions um, that are in place and are so important right now to close down day programming and other important routines outside of the home. This population is uh, also facing staffing shortages within the group homes due to uh, restrictions around coming to work with illness that are, again are so important. But these restrictions um, run the risk of causing destabilization of physical and mental health issues and increasing the risk of hospitalization at this time. It's so important that family physicians and psychiatrists are available as well as um, telehealth and mental health crisis lines to support workers right now to prevent emergency department and hospitalization. I think it's helpful to try and outline different groups with um, complexity um, and, and so that we can know which patients we're talking about in terms of adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Here is a group of patients who have severe physical health conditions um, as a subgroup um, that put them at risk for serious illness with COVID. Um, in terms of preventing infection, um, th this group is often wheelchair bound um, and therefore not moving around. So that is somewhat protective, but they have a high level of contact for care in terms of transferring and, and, and hygiene measures. We need to be aware that some of them um, require things like suctioning to manage their severe respiratory illness, which is an aerosol generating procedure and requires N95 um, mask if we are worried about that individual and how them under droplet precautions. In the event of a positive COVID case for this individual, it would be important to isolate them in their room and to have a plan to handle a positive case in a shared room or someone who has a roommate and to try to figure out if there is an empty room in the home for that person to be moved to. We need to determine who had contacted this patient and define other clients as exposed. And again, be aware of the special droplet precautions that may need to be in place. In terms of avoiding hospital or emergency departments for this particular group, again, the on-call family physician or nurse needs to be in place. Action plan medications for infections um, such as recurrent urinary tract infections could be filled and available in the home so that uh, group home workers don't need to take the person to the emergency department for something simple like a UTI right now. A second group of patients um, that uh, have higher levels of complexity at this time are those with behaviors that challenge, that can cause risk of harm to self or to others, and that this would then result in a hospitalization or, or emergency department visit. Often this group, um, as mentioned, has difficulty understanding or coping with social distancing and hygiene measures that may be important in the home and community at this time. In terms of prevention, be particularly aware of the older patient with this profile, the patient who's over 50 years old with this profile, they are at higher risk of severe COVID illness based on their age alone. Um, importance of as possible and, and that these are our group homes often where the patients really need to move around freely, um, but there are small things hopefully that we can be doing to distance um, socially as much as possible in the homes and encouraging um, eating meals separately as possible, regular hand washing and of course cleaning surfaces regularly. In the event of a positive case, it's so important that there's been a proactive discussion um, for these patients who, who require really very special care um, with the public health agency. How do we wear PPE in the setting of a home where it's very difficult, if not impossible and unsafe for patients to be able to stay in their rooms because of their behavioral needs? Um, how can we 
uh, really make sure that we balance the importance of isolating clients from each other in this setting, but avoid, as mentioned, a behavioral exacerbation that could result in hospitalization. And lastly, and emphasizing again, so important that uh, on-call psychiatry is available at this time, that medications that we try to use as little as possible, but in this case may be needed more um, as a PRN to help with behaviors that challenge are filled and ready in the home. And lastly, touching on a, a, a third group of patients um, with mild intellectual disability who live independently. Um, but there's a subgroup of these patients who, who may struggle um, significantly with mental health issues or addictions. Some of the instability experienced around um, these problems may result in attending the emergency department um, it frequently for issues that may be managed better elsewhere, particularly at this time, where going to the ER may confer some risk of exposure. So important right now as a preventative measure that we help this group to understand social distancing and we support um, going through withdrawal from substances if that is occurring, um, if there is an addiction issue. Calling them regularly, um, simple phone contact, um, to help with the reduced contact they're experiencing with their friends and providing um, delivery of medications and groceries as possible. If an individual um, with this profile were to develop COVID, they would be under forced quarantine at home. Um, they would be very likely to have a mild illness and they would be likely to, because this cohort is often younger, um, with less physical um, conditions such as respiratory issues, than, than others. Having said that, forced quarantine will be very difficult to understand and, and, and to manage. And again, that phone contact and those supports of the essentials being delivered to the home is critical. Again, avoiding hospital and the emergency department, the on-call crisis lines, checking in proactively, and being aware that some of our patients may be experiencing withdrawal from substances um, while they are being maintained at home. I just wanted to briefly mention a fourth group, which sort of overlaps in some ways with the third group, um, but not all people who are sort of living uh, uh, outside of uh, group home or residential supported settings um, live alone. And uh, there's a group of individuals who are living with their families. And this is particularly concerning when the parents are older themselves, which is putting them at increased risk for uh, COVID-related illness. So keeping in mind that it is very difficult right now for family caregivers who don't have around the clock staff coming in to switch off uh, uh, in terms of the support that they're providing, but for the most part, they're doing that supporting alone. Um, they're um, helping to support their loved one with all the changes that have happened in their routine. Um, but at the same time, they're quite frightened about what could happen to the person uh, with a disability in their household, but also what might happen to them if they get ill or other members of their family. So it's extra important for us to be thinking in terms of prevention here uh, and supporting people if uh, someone does get ill, that there be a, a, a crisis plan uh, that goes beyond even the crisis plans that maybe were developed in the past pre-COVID, really thinking about what will happen and who is available to help support this family if someone becomes ill. This is um, a, a hopefully a helpful um, overview, um, just relating um, uh, uh, the situation for the, these complex patients to that perhaps of patients in long-term care in terms of the guidance that can help us for expedited testing um, and isolation um, of, of patients. Um, adults living in these group home settings who have these um, complex um, features um, are similar to adults in long-term care um, and their testing um, needs to be expedited um, should they become ill in the same way that we would handle outbreak testing in a long-term care facility. Uh, again, doesn't apply to perhaps every single um, group home, but there certainly are some um, that would meet this definition. Any worker, um, health or developmental service based who provides this type of very close direct care um, 
should be considered at this time to be an essential healthcare worker. If we have staff shortages um, or we have an ill staff, um, we will have a problem here. Um, this group when presenting um, to assessment centers um, because they've been told to be off work because they have reported a um, sign of a respiratory illness need to receive testing procedures that are being used for essential healthcare workers. Otherwise, we will have destabilization um, in, in, in our homes um, and we run the risk of hospitalizations as a result. And I'll just mention lastly that patients who are coming home to group homes um, are, benef are, are recommended to have isolation and droplet precautions in place now for 14 days ideally. Um, if they um, have been in hospital for more than 24 hours, we are defining this as a hospitalization um, advocacy for the availability of personal protective equipment is very important for these frontline workers. So I just wanted to take a few moments to highlight um, some practical strategies and things to be keeping in mind uh, so that we can prevent uh, both emergency department and hospitalizations if possible uh, for this group. So uh, at a time where people are losing their routines and the sort of meaningful activities that they're doing day to day, anything we can establish or set up in that regard is really important. Uh, and sometimes it's helpful, I guess, to think about what the old routines were and what's the sort of new COVID iteration of that in this time where we're doing physical distancing. Having on hand simple explanations that sometimes have to be repeated over and over about why we're not going to the day program today or why it is that we wash our hands. So having visuals, having words to be used that are said in the same way by different people, just helping everyone understand in this time of change what's going on. Maintaining social connections as much as possible, uh, whether it's uh, by phone or using virtual ways of keeping in touch with other people and recognizing what that loss is like when people don't have those connections. And also continuing to keep opportunities for people to make choices at a time where a lot of uh, choice has been taken away from people's lives, making sure there are still choices every day that people get to make. Recognizing the incredible resilience in this population and finding ways to build on that. Um, but keeping in mind, and this is both for people with uh, intellectual or developmental disabilities, but also for caregivers, um, that at the very uh, sort of most basic level, the importance right now of sleep, of drinking fluids, and of eating uh, proper foods and making sure that um, regular eating, sleeping, and drinking is happening, as well as um, making sure people are still moving their bodies and uh, getting some physical activity. Knowing that, um, you know, in this time where there's so many restrictions, this is a group where we still need to ask for help. And if it is too difficult to manage uh, on your own, if you have a developmental disability and you know you need help, you've got to be able to ask for it as caregivers or staff as well, knowing if this is just feeling like it's a, becoming an at-risk situation, knowing that you need help and knowing what kind of help would be most useful. And finally, remembering that our healthcare providers in family medicine and psychiatry and mental health are still working and still available. So even though we're trying to reduce uh, in-person visits as much as possible, there are many ways we can keep connecting proactively uh, with our mental health and physical health care teams to keep people healthy at home. But keeping in mind that uh, this group is at greater risk for going to hospital, we also need to be prepared. So everyone with a developmental disability does need to have healthcare communication tools available that describe who they are and what their healthcare needs are. And also if there is some kind of virtual or in-person visit, knowing what happens at that visit and what the recommendations are and that it's recorded. So I mentioned here the two primary care program tools about my health and today's healthcare visit. People can benefit if they have to go to the hospital and understanding what's gonna happen in that hospital and also might, how it might be a little bit different than what usually happens. So having social stories, books beyond words, pictures that explain easily what it is that's happening. Being prepared is going to hospital with resources that you can bring into the emergency department, um, keeping in mind that the person will need to potentially take their medications while they're waiting, that snacks and water and also activities to be doing at that time are really important um, while we wait. Knowing that it's really helpful to uh, know 
who the people are in that person's life. If someone gets admitted to hospital, is there a way to capture that through a picture, through something that's on an iPad, something that can be heard on the iPad, some messages, um, just helping people feel like they're not so out of touch with what's going on outside of the hospital. And planning very specifically how to be in touch and stay in touch. If someone is admitted to hospital, there are restrictions on who can be in hospital with that person. So having things like a phone, um, uh, uh, an iPad or a communication device that helps for, for that keeping in touch. Making sure there's a team of people who can provide support outside of hospital to the people who are inside of hospital and maybe having a key liaison person who is that point of contact between those two places so that when at any point 24 seven, someone from the hospital needs information or communication, they know easily who it is that they're contacting and that people in the community know how they're gonna share that information with each other. Again, asking for help in terms of navigation and advocacy um, during this time of hospitalization, it can be incredibly stressful. So figuring out what supports are needed for caregivers as well as the person in hospital. And continuing, even if that person has been admitted, for example, to the hospital, that doesn't mean that the work of the family physician or the psychiatrist or the mental health team is over. There can still be a lot of partnering and liaising with the people in hospital. So keeping up those um, contacts and updates with the team who's from the community. And just keeping in mind that things are different. It is not business as usual anymore in our hospitals, and that will affect people with uh, intellectual and developmental disabilities. So for example, if people are wearing, and this is also, I suppose, in homes, if people are wearing personal protective equipment, sometimes you can't see the person's face to know what the emotion is that they're showing. You can't read their lips, and it's harder to understand what they're saying. There are limitations around um, touch. Uh, and there's also less freedom around moving around or going to different activities within the hospital. Everyone is going to encounter longer wait times than usual. And there are important restrictions on who can be in the hospital and rules about visitors, which will really impact this population. It's also important to recognizing that the staff working in the hospitals right now are working so hard. And like us, they're also feeling anxious. And sometimes they're dealing with some very difficult situations um, that can be uh, upsetting and also traumatizing for them. So I think uh, we want the compassion of our healthcare providers, but they also need our compassion for what they're experiencing. And we really need to be thinking about how we're working together. Um, I highlighted a document here that came out from the NHS in the UK that specifically outlines some very simple steps. It's a short document, it's just a couple of pages of how to support people who have a learning disability or what we call an intellectual disability or autism or both uh, during this pandemic. And we have some links to that resource as well as other resources. Here we have a page with resources um, and we're continuing to grow information on our HCARD COVID page for resources in particular for people with disabilities and for 